I want to share a couple verses with you out of the book of James. And uh, you can just write that passage down and then you can look at that at another time. But here in uh, James, if I can get there, I will get there in a minute. It is going to let me do this. There we go. In James chapter 3 and verse number 2, I just want you to listen to what it says here. For we all stumble in many ways. We know that, right? Matter of fact, that's why we have our shirts out in the lobby that people can pick up. Uh, you can purchase those out in the lobby. It says, no perfect people allowed, right? We understand that there is no one that's perfect. No matter how hard we try to be perfect, we're not perfect. There are no perfect people. For we all stumble in many ways. Okay? We may not like what somebody else does. We may not like what somebody else says. But at the end of the day, the only sin that we're willing to put up with is the one that we wear personally. We don't like anybody else's sin, but we'll put up with our own, unfortunately, a lot of times. But at the end of the day, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to know and realize that we're all sinners, we're all not perfect. And the scripture says, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a, what's that word? Perfect man. Now, understand this, all right, just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, a Bible study here for just a moment. You can jot this down. This could be really important to you as you're studying the Word of God. When you read the word perfect in Scripture, it doesn't mean perfect as we know it in our English language. What it means, that word interpreted, means mature. That man is a mature man. All right? My kids, as they get older, they become more perfect or more mature. That doesn't mean they become flawless. It just means they make more right decisions. And they're taking life more seriously. And so this is what this verse is saying here. It's saying, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man. We know what stumbling's like, right? Uh, the other day, my wife, she was doing something around here at the church, and she ended up stumbling and, and bruised herself up. Uh, and that's not it. I'm sorry. She's going to let me have it later now. I tell you, no. Uh, I could have used an example myself, right? But it's not as much fun to use it on myself. Uh, but she took a stumble, and, and she got bruised up a little bit because of a stumble or a fall. And, and the Scripture is saying here that if we control our lips, if we are able to control our words, that we are a more mature person, and, and it says, if anyone does not stumble, and it's talking about in his words, he is a mature man, able to bridle his whole body. That's powerful. In this regard, if you miss anything I say in the front part of this message, don't miss this part right here. If you are able to bridle your tongue, you're able to determine the course of your life. If you're able to bridle your tongue, you're able to determine the course of your life. That's what the scripture's saying, a bridle. You know, on a horse, they put a bridle in a horse's mouth in order that it can be determined the direction of that horse. And if your tongue is not tamed, if it's not bridled, then you have no control in what direction your life is headed. Some of you feel like your life is out of control, right? Well, this is one of the places that you can begin to examine and find out. Is my tongue bridled? Am I careful how my words are guarded? Because in guarding my words, in, in bridling my tongue, I can determine the direction or the course of my life. And it goes on to say, if we put bits in the horses, in the mouth of the horses, so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. Look at the ship also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. 
How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Isn't it something we see these, these forest fires that happen in California and other places, and all it took was somebody just pitching a cigarette out or somebody being careless and lighting a match or doing something, and it all started with just a very small flame, and it started in a, a, a blaze. And I want you to understand, the Bible says your words are the very same have the very same power. Last week we talked about how that our words can bring life or they can bring what? Death. The, our words are powerful. And it goes on to say, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, uh, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast, bird, of reptile, sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human, no human being can tame the tongue. Now you may be here this morning, you may say, wow, you know, if, if the tongue can't be tamed, then I guess it's hopeless, right? Well, let's continue to listen and hear what it says. And it is a restless evil full of dead man, a deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father... And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. We lift our hands and we praise God. We lift our hands in the air. All right, anyway. And, and we can praise and we can worship. And yet, then we can turn and go outside the building and curse the very people that are made in the very image of the one we just said we were worshiping and praising. Something's wrong with that. Does a spring, or the, the scripture goes on to say, from the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. He's saying believers, Christians, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, uh, pour forth uh, from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to drink out of that faucet. Would you? I'd be like, okay, Russian roulette. Is it going to be fresh water or salt water? You know, right? I forget the, I think jelly, um, jelly belly, jelly beans or what, I think they came out with, um, I forget what the name of these jelly beans are. Somebody help me out. Do you remember? All right. Uh, yeah, they're jelly belly, jelly beans, but I cannot think of the name. Oh, bamboozled is the name of them. Bamboozled. If you ever see any, try them. They're great. Wonderful. Okay. Bamboozled. Let me tell you what bamboozled jelly beans are. All right, one that looks like uh, one could be a banana, and there's another one that looks just like it could be a rotten egg. One could be a pineapple, or it could be puke. Uh, one, I kid you not. I kid you not. You reach in a the bag, they look alike, you put it in your mouth, and you may be bamboozled. Just depends on which one you stick in your mouth. All right, dirty socks. There's all kinds of different ones they got in there. Okay. But you know what? Nobody would intentionally drink from a faucet or a spring that brings fresh water and salt water. You're going to find what is going to satisfy the quench or the thirst. And listen, we need to be careful of the people we allow to influence our life because when we're around people that pour out fresh and bitter water at the same spring, you're only hurting yourself. You have to protect your heart. You have to protect your mind. And the scripture goes on to tell us here in this passage that these things ought not be so. And we can find so many times where uh, these things are happening. Of course, I would encourage you to read the rest of James chapter 3. It's very powerful. The Bible says where bitter envy and strife is, there is every evil work. And it talks about uh, how that this kind of wisdom doesn't come from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Or in the ESV it says that it's uh, earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. There's a lot of things it says about the tongue. That's so important for us to get that and for us to understand that. But here's a passage I want to bring to light, and we're going to kind of launch out in this, because what I just shared with you is some things that are for us to understand about the power of the tongue and how important the tongue is. 
But as we talked last week, one of the things I talked to you about is that the tongue is controlled by what? The heart. The heart is important. Thank you, Cody. All right. Now, <laughs> all right. Here, I want you to see this verse, all right? In, in Psalms chapter 19 and verse 14. Psalm 19, verse 14. The scripture says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I want you to get this for just a moment. Let the words of my mouth, how important are the words of your mouth? The words of your mouth will determine the direction or the course of your life. Let the words of my mouth, and then it goes even deeper yet to say, and the meditation of my what? Heart. Do you realize that what you allow your heart to meditate on is the very things that will pour out of your mouth? I love to be around people whose heart are stayed upon the Lord because guess what? Our conversations are oftentimes centered around. The Lord. The things that you meditate on are the things that are going to come out of your mouth. So you want to know what you meditate on a lot? Just listen to yourself talk. That's what you meditate on. Meditation of the heart is important because the heart will determine what the mouth says. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we have to understand, if it's not in the heart, it won't come out. But if it's in the heart, it'll come out. Once again, I've said before, where somebody would say something, they look and they go, oh my, I can't believe I said that. I don't know where that came from. It's like it came out of your heart. Whatever's in there will come out. Well, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of things to go into my heart over the course of my lifetime that I'm not happy or proud of. And I want to do everything I can to change the course of the meditation of my heart in order that the words of my mouth are acceptable in the sight of the Lord, who is my rock and my redeemer, my salvation. I trust that be true for you. The next passage I'd like to share with you is in the book of Psalms chapter 19. And verse number 8, or verse number 7, I love this. Now this is where we're going to talk about our directing our heart of meditation on the Lord. And in meditating on the right things, the words of our mouth are going to speak the right things. So let's begin to meditate on the right stuff in order that we can have a heart of thanksgiving. Because that's where we're at this, this week, is we're stopping to be thankful and we're, we're trying not to be caught up in the busyness of everything. And I realize that the uh, department stores and everybody else try very diff uh, try well, I don't think they intentionally try to do this, but they are beginning to overwhelm Thanksgiving now with Christmas. And all of a sudden, it's like Thanksgiving is being looked over and we're already thinking about Christmas, right? Used to the earliest you thought about Christmas was Black Friday. Okay? But now, Black Friday's already started in some stores. Walmart had Black Friday just a few days ago already. How do you do that? That's oxymoron, right? You can't have Black Friday. It ain't Friday yet. <laughs> All right? But needless to say, some have already started their sales. And it seems like right Christmas gets earlier and earlier and earlier every year. Because... We fail to be thankful, and when we lose our thankfulness, we get in a dangerous place in our life. So I want us to reflect on what we should be thankful for. Look at Psalms 19, verse 7 and following. The scripture says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Isn't that cool? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord 
are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. I want you to understand when we know the Lord and the power of who He is and what He has made provision for us with, we then are able to meditate on those things. And when we meditate on those things, when we surrender and submit our thoughts on who the Lord is and what He does for us and for what He has done for us and what He continues to do for us, then the meditation of our heart will then cause our words to be sweet and acceptable in the eyes of God. But those who meditate on their dislikes and they're always grumbling about everything. Remember last week I had mentioned to you how it's not only important that we say good words to those around us, but we need to say good things because the Bible says from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, but the Bible also says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As you think determines who you are. In other words, the meditation of your heart will determine what kind of person you are. And therefore, it will come out of your mouth. So when we meditate on the right things, when we set our mind, our affections, our longing after the things of the Lord, then the words of our mouth will be sweet. They'll be like a honeycomb to those around us. Have you ever been around someone who just seems like every time you get around them, you one, you like yourself more than you do when you're not around them? There are some people in my life that are like that. I can't wait to be around them. Honestly, I can't. They make me feel good about myself when I'm around them. Okay, I don't mean that in some weird way, some self-gratifying way. I don't. I just, have you, let me put it in the opposite. You ever been around somebody that makes you feel like a dog all the time? I bet you want to hang around them, don't you? No, you see what I'm saying? In the opposite, you can't wait to get around someone who when you're around them, they make you feel good about yourself. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't mean that somehow or another that, um, that we get all kinds of good qualities for somebody to see. Somebody who is kind with their words, somebody who has sweetness that comes out of them, they can look right through you. They can see the reality of who you are and still like the show, as they say. When we take on the eyes of Jesus, did you know Jesus was that way? Why do you think publicans and sinners and prostitutes and everybody else had no problem at all finding themselves coming to Jesus? Because he could look right through them and still like the, the show. What was the show? The show was simply this. Jesus saw them for who he knew they could be rather than who they were. I think too many times we look at other people and we look at them on the surface. We read a book by its cover and then when we read the book by its cover, we decide whether or not we're going to like them or what we're going to say about them or whatever. How about we just see them as Jesus sees them? When we meditate on the things of God, when we understand how God looks at things and we look at others in the same way, we're going to be sweet with our words. We're going to say kind things about others. We're even going to defend others when others try to run them down. You defend those who you love, right? 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 For just a moment, I'll pick on Bryce. He said something about my daughter the other day, and I got him good. <laughs> you don't talk about my daughter. <laughs> right? Nothing serious. But you know what? When we, we would defend our loved ones, right? Because we love them. If somebody says something that disc somebody we love or somebody we care about, we're going to stand to their defense. Now, does that mean that they're, they're, uh, that they're guiltless, that maybe they've never done anything? I mean, look, they're probably they've done something wrong, but needless to say, we ought to have good things to say about one another and in supporting one another and caring for one another. But the scripture here in Psalms is talking about how that when our mind is stayed on the Lord and understand that the Lord is perfect, he is reviving the inner man. He is reviving the soul. 
when we meditate on Him, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you go in that category of simple with me. Praise Jesus, he makes wise the simple. Because that would be me. The precepts. The sweetness of the word of God is right, rejoicing the heart. When a person understands the precepts of God, their heart rejoices. When I know what God desires, I can rejoice in that because now I know how God wants me to live and what he wants me to do with my life. I've had some people say, you know, when I was working in teen ministry, oh yeah, you know, you got to be careful Teens, you know, you don't want to tell them too much or put too many rules or what on them. And I do agree there's some people who choke people out with rules and all. But there are some who try to make out like you can have no expectations. Parents, hear me out for a minute, all right, for just a moment. I'm going to talk to parents. Teens, you don't have to listen. Kids, you don't have to listen. But you can come back to me in a minute. Just don't distract anybody around you. Listen, no problem. All right, now, here's the thing. Adults, don't be afraid to have expectations for your kids. For your teens. Because young people don't care what you expect of them as much as they care about knowing what you expect of them. There's nothing worse than living life with somebody and it seems like they're always changing the rules or always like, well, why'd you do that? Didn't you know? Blah, blah. And it's like they're going, no, I didn't know. All right? You know, whose fault is that? All right, it could be one of two. It'd either be that they weren't listening to you when you told them the last 100 times. Not that that would ever happen in your home, okay? Or it means that we didn't do good communicating it to them. But at the end of the day, expectations are not bad. They bring confidence and they bring rejoicing. When you understand the boundaries and the life that, how life is supposed to be, when you live in those boundaries, things are so much sweeter and so much better. And you know what? It's the same way with our relationship with God. I've had some people say to me, Pastor, you know, God's not about, uh, you know, having expectations on us or whatever. That's not true. God does have expectations on us. But he also says in his word that we're unable to meet those expectations humanly. The only way, and remember I said earlier about no man can tame the tongue, no man can control the tongue. Did you know that's true? But it doesn't mean we're hopeless. I can't control my tongue. But what I can do is to redirect my heart on the things of God and let Him control my tongue. The meditation of my heart will control my tongue. That's not me controlling it. It's that in which I am meditating on that will control it. I can't control how I live my life but only to a certain degree, and then at some point in time, I get off course. If I'm doing it on my, that's why a lost person can do right things for a while, but eventually they're going to drift off center because they have no, they have no anchor. For a believer, the anchor is Jesus Christ, and the meditation of our heart on the things of Jesus is what brings about stability in our life and our heart. And the meditation of our heart then will control. Our lips and the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commands of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. I just heard it said yesterday, this is powerful, don't miss this thought. What you fear controls you. Did you know that? What you fear controls you. So if you fear something, then that is going to control you. And you know who we ought to fear? It's not what we fear. We ought to fear the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to fear God. I don't mean like tremble in fear in a sense, but it is a respect. It is an honor. When you fear something, let me give you a for instance. Let me put a face on this fear, if I may. Let me unpack this word for you, if I may. You fear those that you work for. 
you might say, well, I don't fear them. I ain't scared of them. I'll tell them, yeah, well, you work really hard at getting there on time and clocking in because you know that if you don't do that, you may lose your job. I'm not saying you're scared of them. I'm not saying that somehow they control you in that sense, but there is, a, there is an honorable fear that causes you to do the right things. If we fear other people, all right, now, Teens, I hope you're back with me, and young people, I hope you're back with me. Teens, if, if there's something God wants you to do in your life, maybe there's a certain course of action God has put on your heart, and you know that God wants you to serve Him with your life, and maybe God's kind of been laying on your heart about pursuing that endeavor of living, uh, of, of studying out, whether it's going to college or doing something, going somewhere that's going to get you Bible training or whatever. But you may have an aunt or an uncle who said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for your school if you'll go do this and you'll get this certain degree. And there's a part of you that fears that relative and it's controlling you. Listen, you ought to fear God and God above all else. And you ought to do what God says. And fear Him above all else. Adults, the same is true in your life. I don't care what your employer says. I don't care what anybody else says. If God has shown you some things in your life, that there's things that you need to be, things that you need to do, and if your job is compromised for doing what's right, you need to fear God before you fear men. That's putting the rubber where it meets the road. That's not easy. When I was working over in Henderson, Kentucky at a place called Country Cooking, one of the things that I tried to do really diligently is to work as unto the Lord and not unto men. And so when I got that job as a cook, one of the things we had to do at the end of the night was to clean. And I was the type of person, if I was expected to clean the restrooms and, and to clean all my workstation up and do certain things, I wanted to be as good as I could. And I remember one of the cooks came to me uh, one day, about, oh, I was about five days into my new job. And he said to me, he said, John, if you keep spending so much time cleaning things the way you are, you're going to lose your job because these managers want to get out of here at night. I said, look, I realize I might take an extra 10, 15 minutes to get done. But I am going to continue to do it because it's the right thing to do. And I'm eventually going to get so fast at it, I'm going to do a better job at what I do than, than, it, than you do at the time it takes you to do what you do. It's going to take me some time, but I'm going to get there. And I told them, I said, if they want to fire me for doing too good of a job, then so be it, let them fire me. I don't work for them. I work for Jesus. And if I don't feel like that I'm pleasing Jesus in, in what I'm doing, then so be it. That's not an easy decision. Let me, let me fast forward that story because I was only 18 years old when I had that job and I did that. Fast forward, when I went to Word of Life Bible Institute in Scroon Lake, New York, I remember one day I was on the phone with my mom and dad on a Sunday evening, and I said, how'd services go today? Oh, great. He said, hey, you know, Scott Grimes was here today. And I'm like, Scott Grimes, who's Scott Grimes? He said, don't you remember that was your manager at Country Cooking? I said, are you kidding me? He came to church, yeah, he and his wife, and they both got saved today. I'm like, you're kidding me. And just to listen to the progress of their life and how they eventually got involved in ministry and serving and had a, a class they were teaching. And then they ended up moving away before I came back from college. And they moved off and they got connected with the church where they moved. And you never know how God's going to use your life, but always do what's right. May the meditation of your heart be set on the Lord. May you understand who He is. May you bless the Lord. And may you worship Him in your life. And may you understand that it's because of Him and Him alone that you're able to live and to breathe and to do the things that you do. The Bible says in Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all 
your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed he make known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and bountiful in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And the scripture says that he takes our sin. And it says as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Wow. If you're going to clap, church, clap. Don't just have heart. Listen, this is the word of God. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered again. You may say, but pastor, you don't understand the mistakes I've made in my life. You don't understand the lines that I've crossed in my life. God's not concerned about the lines you've crossed in your life. What he's concerned about is where are you headed from this day forward with your life? What are you doing with it? You give it to God. You surrender it to Him. You lay it at His feet. And you say, God, here I am. God, I worship you. I bless your name. I praise you because you're everything to me. Your love endures to all generations. Church, we ought to know that our celebration is in God and Him alone. So where are you in your life? Are you here saying, man, my heart's so heavy. I wish I could rejoice like that. Listen, the meditation of your heart will determine what your lips do. It'll determine the words that come out of your mouth. It'll determine whether you speak life on others or whether you're speaking, speaking death on others. Let the love of God shine from your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed.